Hello, I'm Jason Kendall, and I'd like to welcome you to my Introductory Cosmology channel. I've been going through Dr. Barbara Ryden's textbook, Introduction to Cosmology, and now I'm up to Chapter 3, Section 5, The friedman lemaitre robertson walker Metric, or How We Measure Cosmological Spacetime. Before I begin, I just want to say thank you to my Patreon supporters and my YouTube subscribers. Their support means a lot to me because it does keep this channel going. If you like what's been happening on the channel so far, please join us because I give all my supporters and members special perks and advanced views to all my videos. Now let's get back to it. Last time we looked at the spatial metric for an isotropic homogeneous space with constant and uniform curvature. We ended on these particular coordinates, called hyperspherical coordinates, because they're what Ryden uses in her textbook. They describe an embedding of a three-dimensional space in a four-dimensional space. These equations represent what's called a three-surface of a four-ball. That is to say, it's a three-dimensional surface with some constant curvature embedded in a flat four-dimensional hyperspace. Let's now go over how the curvature constant, k, relates to the radius of curvature for the space. We see that in the flat case, that k equals zero, meaning no curvature. The positively curved space, k equals r squared, and likewise for the negatively curved space, k equals minus r squared. In both of these cases, the big R is the characteristic constant curvature radius for the space. What's interesting about these coordinates is that for the ease of pedagogy and understanding, it's usually broken up into those three separate functions. However, these three functions are exactly the same as the analytic single function you see off to the right. In that nerfy looking function, k has some fixed value, and little r is the independent variable as the radius for some central origin point. The radius of curvature, r squared, is actually the inverse of k. We'll see how that gets involved later. As for the analytic function, if you put in the positive value for k, then you get a sine function. A negative value for k gives the hyperbolic sine function, and k equals zero wipes out every term in the summation except where n equals zero, which gives the simple middle result. Either with the analytic function or the broken out trio, this spatial metric satisfies a lot of things we need. It's uniformly curved and isotropic around every point in the space, as well as homogeneous throughout the space. We saw this in an earlier video too. Let's now begin the process of connecting these geometric considerations into a relativistic theory of gravity. Our first step to connecting to such a theory is to go back to our special relativistic theory, the one without gravity. In my previous video on special relativity, which if you haven't seen, you'll want to go back and watch that, then come back here, I showed that the Minkowski spacetime metric was our solution to a spacetime that is homogeneous at every point in the spacetime and is isotropic around every point in the spacetime. Now that I've looked at curved spaces, we see quite readily that the spatial part of the metric is this exactly flat isotropic homogeneous space from the previous slide. A really important side point is that ds squared is what's called the space-time interval, which is invariant under changes of coordinates. The coordinate changes can be translations, rotations, or boosts. No matter what, it is this space-time interval that shows the true distance between two events in space and time. Space and time are so intertwined as both theoretical and experimental entities that we cannot reasonably separate them any longer. That's why we always say space-time rather than space and time. But what's a good intuitive motivation for this metric? The Minkowski spacetime metric is the one we use when we wish to understand the propagation of light due to Maxwell's equations. The factor c was a speed that showed up in those equations. It served to tell us the wave propagation speed and is constant no matter the relative motion of the observer or the emitter. This led Einstein to discard Newtonian kinematics and extend Galilean relativity's reach into a relative time measurement. So let's use this metric and ask, how does a photon travel from there to here in this spacetime? We can assume, without losing any generality, that our photon travels to us from some distant galaxy positioned at coordinates r, theta, and phi. It travels in some straight line from there to here at r, theta, phi equal to zero. This is the situation in the Stickman cartoon off to the left. Next, since we're traveling in a straight line, there is no change in d theta or d phi, which means that d omega is then just set to be zero. We also know that photons propagate at the speed of light. 
In terms of our coordinates, we will require that the rate of change of the radial coordinate with respect to time must be equal to c, the speed of light. The only value of the space-time interval ds that satisfies this condition is for it to be exactly zero. Therefore, the path of a photon is called a null space-time interval. According to light, it does not travel any space-time distance at all. To us, it may have started off as an energy packet keeping an electron in a higher orbital level than the ground state until it's released by the electron. It then travels through space until it hits, say, another atom of the same type and excites that electron into that higher state. That's what we would see from the outside. We might say that the photon traveled eight light years from a distant star to our detector. But to the photon, it never left the atom. One atom is exactly the same as the other to it, and no space-time interval is traversed between them. Another way to think about it is photons don't experience time or distance, because these two things are exactly the same to them. In addition to this conundrum, anything that travels at the speed of light travels on a null space-time geodesic. This includes gravitational waves and possibly theoretical zero-mass neutrinos. The key is that the photon has no mass, and nothing that has mass can travel at the speed of light or accelerate up to it. Anyway, we'll need this in later lectures on photon propagation in the space-time that incorporates the effects of gravity. It is this definition of the metric for dimensions with three space-like dimensions and one time-like dimension that has the specific sign signature of minus plus 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 as can be easily seen in the topmost version of this metric that puts us into what's called a pseudo-Riemannian manifold and not a Riemannian manifold. If it were plus, 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 it would be a Riemannian manifold. This extra change in signature makes it a pseudo-Riemannian manifold. It is this minus plus, plus, plus signature that permeates all relativistic theories of gravity, whether Einsteinian or otherwise. Next, we do know that there's gravity in the universe. So how does that change the Minkowski flat space-time metric? To see what that means, we need to ask if there are any additional symmetries, both spatially and temporally, that allow for the change of the metric through time. The answer is the friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric. It is what we get when we say, what if the space were not just uniformly flat, but rather could be uniformly curved, we already saw how that symmetry plays out. In addition, we've added a time-dependent scale factor to the spatial part of the metric that affects all spatial dimensions uniformly and equally across the entire spacetime. This metric is the one that is used in standard cosmological studies. It is the fundamental baseline idea that permeates all measurements in the field. We see it here in two forms. Across the top, we see it in the space-time interval form, which adds up all the contributions and tells us the total space-time distance interval. On the bottom, the matrix form shows the metric in its tensorial form, g mu nu. There are 16 possible elements to the metric, but the symmetry of the space eliminates six of them, and the symmetry with respect to time eliminates six more. The zeroed-out space-space components of the metric show that the rotational and translational spatial symmetry is complete and uniform across the entire spacetime. The zeroed-out time-space elements show that the passage of time does not affect the measurement of space. It also says that changing locations in space does not affect the rate of change of the passage of time. Time flows at the same rate at all locations in the space. It also has flowed at the same rate for all of cosmic history for all locations in the metric. This is an incredibly large symmetry for the temporal aspect of time. Let's now go over each part of the metric in turn. 